the book doesn't have negative interest rates, and I'll show you some of the impacts of negative interest rates on asset prices. Because if we fall into a recession, we'll probably go into negative interest rates. Japan's already doing it, and New York's already doing it. So I'll walk you through basically the mechanics of the impact of negative interest rates on asset prices. Okay. So first, if you know, the risk-free rate is the rate. So imagine if we go negative interest rates, the yield curve will come down. This has never happened before. Okay. So what's the impact in the implications, um, you've got to look at the models. You've got to go to valuation models, and you've got to look at the cost of debt and equity and return on the debt and equity models. So first, uh, what, are, what equation determines the risk-free rate? And this is going to be a moral, okay? So I'm going to be able to gauge your engagement, you gauge your participation in your grasp of the concepts. And you're going to need a calculator uh, later on when we get into the case study. So if I'm trying to calculate the risk-free rate or nominal interest rates, what equation do I use? Fisher. Yeah, what's it called? Fisher equation. Yeah, Fisher equation. Okay. Okay, and then Cerrito, what's the equation? Okay. What is it? Yeah, it's the real rate. Plus inflation expectations. Plus inflation expectations. So if the nominal interest rates turn negative, then what are inflation expectations? If the nominal interest rate is negative, then what's nominal where what's inflation expectation? Negative. Negative. And what does that tell you about the economy? It's probably going into a recession. It's probably going into a recession. Okay. Uh, that's the biggest problem with negative interest rates. Okay. Uh, what are the impacts? of negative interest rates on the cost and the expected return <coughs> on debt and equity. So I'm trying, if I'm trying to determine the cost of the expected return on the debt, what's the equation that I would use? The equation, if I'm trying to figure out the expected return on the debt or the cost of the debt, what equation do I use? What's the first variable in the model? It's already on the same What? What? This cost of debt. It's the cost or the expected return on the debt. The risk rate. So the free rate. Okay. Plus risk premium. The risk premium. Give me the risk premiums. Credit default. Maturity. Credit default. What? Maturity. Uh, plus maturity. And illiquidity. And illiquidity. That's awesome. Nice job. Give me the cost of the equity. Is that capital? What is it? Capital. Cap cap capital asset pricing model? Yeah. Is that correct? Okay. Give me the equation, please. There's three. There's three. Plus beta. Plus beta. Expect return on what? Market. On the market? Um, <coughs> minus risk free. Minus risk free. Okay, excellent. So if risk free rates turn negative, what happens to the expected return and the cost of the debt? It goes what? Down. It's down. Okay. And if the risk free rates turn negative, what's the expected return on the equity and the cost of the equity? Again, if we're just going to use some, some basic you know, cash flow models, what about the coupon, and the expected return or cost of the debt, or the cash flow, future cash flow, divided by the expected return or cost of the debt. If negative interest rates reduce the cost of the debt, what happens to the value of the bonds? If negative interest rates pushes down the cost of the debt and the expected return on the debt, what happens to the value of the bonds? They go up. up. And if <coughs> negative interest rates push down the cost of the equity or expected return on the equity, what happens to the value of the equity? It goes down. Okay. If the 
negative interest rates push down the cost of the equity or expect a return on the equity, what happens to the value of the equity? Because is, I'm not hearing anybody. Okay. I'm not hearing everybody participate. We need to verbalize this. This is extremely critical. And if the reduction in the cost of the equity or expected return on the equity goes down significantly, what happens to the value of the equity in the debt? It goes up significantly. It goes up significantly. So if the Federal Reserve implements negative interest rate policy, could it cause the values of stocks and bonds to go up significantly? Yes. Could it create asset price bubbles yeah. in both the stock and the bond market? Yes. Yes. So what happens when the Federal Reserve decides at some future date and time after the economy has started to recover to start to normalize interest rates and bring interest rates back up? What happens when the risk-free rate turns positive again and goes up? What happens to the cost and the expected return on the equity? It goes up. It's going to go up. And what's going to happen to the value of equities? It goes down. Okay, come on, you guys. Goes up, this goes down. Okay. And if the risk free rate turns positive again and goes up, what's going to happen to the cost of the debt and the expected return of the debt? Go up. Go up. Go up. And what's going to happen to the value of bonds? Go down. Go down. That's called an asset price bubble popping. It's a bursting of the asset price bubble. Is that tough on investors and banks that are holding these bonds and these stocks in their portfolio? That's what I was trying to get at. Yield curve dynamics. What kind of curve is this? Yield curve. Yep. What, is, what kind of curve? Upward is sloping. Is Upward sloping. Normal. 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 Okay. Excellent. Nice job. What about that? Flat. Flat. Do that. Inverted. Inverted. And what are inflation expectations in an upward sloping curve? Positive. And for a flat curve. And for an inverted curve, okay. so obviously yield curves can shift up again, causing asset prices to go down, they can shift down, causing asset prices to go up. So basically, asset prices are driven by shifts in the yield curve. That's why it's so important. And the Federal Reserve basically controls the yield curve, particularly on the short end of the yield curve. So asset prices are basically determined by the Federal that's why it's important. So asset prices have the inverse relationship with the cost of capital or the expected return. Yep. So if this goes up, that goes down. If that goes down, this goes up. Okay. So that's what I was trying to explain there. Um, we already got the risk premium model. We already have CAPM. Since we already have identified the cost of the debt and the cost of the equity, how do I calculate the weighted average cost of capital? Calculate the weighted average cost of debt. Cost of debt times right. the cost of your debt times the weight of your debt. Okay, excellent. Weight of the debt, got it. Plus the cost of your equity times the weight of your equity. Okay, excellent. Uh, the weight of the equity. And what do the weights have to add, uh, add up to? 100%. Yeah, 100% or 1. Or 1, yeah. Okay. Can I calculate the weights using the book value of the liabilities? Yeah. Yes. Can I, can I calculate the weights using the market value? Yeah. Yes. Excellent. All right. And then once I get the WAC, what can I use the WAC for? What can I use as capital? Yeah. I can use it as a discount rate to apply what model? Uh, DCF. DCF. In perpetuity. I can use it in growth. I can do multiple. I can do all kinds of stuff with the discount. And we're going to use that to be, well, this could be the expected rate of return or the uh, cost of capital for the capital budgeting process. Okay? Nice job. You guys are doing good. A little more participation. Uh, dynamic yield curves. Okay? When the yield curve inverts, when you see the yield curve invert, what usually happens to the S&P 500? Goes down. Yeah, when the yield curve inverts, what usually happens to the uh, S&P 500? It peaks. It peaks in how, how much time? 12 months. 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12, 12 months. And then what? 
and then in 24 months are normally into a recession. Okay, excellent. Nice job. Okay, so let's move over here and view the modern portfolio. Walk me through, you're in a meeting, uh, we have some new board members, uh, they don't understand any of the steps that you're going to walk us through. Okay. So walk me through the model. Uh, what's on the x-axis? Standard deviation. Of what? Portfolio. Portfolio, okay, what's on the y-axis? Expected return. Of what? Portfolio. Portfolio, okay, what next? You're going to draw the capital allocation line okay. from the y-axis. Line. What's here? It's pretty great. Okay, walk me through, keep me going. Uh, you can draw the utility curve on top. Okay. Can I stop there? At the CAL. You can start at the top. You can get closer. Do I go all the way yes, down? Yeah, Acid touch and then go it upwards. Yeah. And then just take it. Like that. Okay, what else? And then yeah. uh, what's it called? The efficiency okay. frontier. Okay. Excellent. Yeah, it's the efficient frontier. What's this? It's 100% uh, stock. Okay, 100% stock. Okay, what's this? 100% bonds. 100% bonds. Okay, and don't forget to put in the, uh, you know, the lines. Okay, as much detail as possible. Okay, what's this? Market basket. Market basket. And at that, and at that point, what do you get? 70% bonds. No, not yet. What do you get at this point? <coughs> the highest risk adjusted rate of return. The highest risk adjusted rate of return. Okay, the highest risk adjusted rate of return. Okay. Uh, can I uh, move up the efficient frontier? Yes. Okay. And then what am I doing when I'm moving up? You're going to sell bonds and buy stock. Excellent. Nice job. Uh, can I move down the efficient frontier? Yeah. Am I doing what? Stock <coughs> so and stock buying bonds. Can I jump off the efficient frontier? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. And can I move up the efficient uh, the capital allocation line? Yeah. Okay. And what do I need to do? What am I doing if I'm moving up the capital allocation? What am I doing? What am I doing? Alternative Not yet. Is this margin you just have? Yeah. I'm using leverage. So I'm going to use margin on my stock portfolio. What am I going to use on my uh, real estate portfolio? How do I leverage up real estate? Mortgage. Through mortgages. Mortgage finance. Okay. Can I move down the, uh, the capital allocation line? Yes. And through what process? Lending. Through lending. Don't forget to put those in. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's say that I want to diversify my portfolio. And I want to add alternatives to the portfolio. Why would I add alternative assets to my stock bond portfolio? Why would I add alternative assets to my stock bond portfolio? They offer a rate of return with virtually no risk. Um, no, they do have risk. They do have risk. Why would I put, what is the, if I want to diversify this portfolio by putting alternatives in the portfolio, what does the correlation need to be on the alternatives rates of return and the rates of return on stocks and bonds? What's the correlations need to be to get diversification in my portfolio on the rates of return between the alternatives and stocks and bonds. What do the correlations need to be? Negative. Negative? Or it's just no correlation? No correlation. Negative correlation and what else? Positive but? Low. But low. Okay, low, no, or negative correlation. Okay. So you would add alternatives to your stock bond portfolio because their rates of return have low, no, or negative correlation with the rates of return on the stocks and bonds. So if I add alternatives to the stock bond portfolio, what happens to the efficient frontier? What happens?
what happens to the efficient printer? <coughs> I add alternatives to my stockpiling portfolio. What happens to the efficient printer? This is the most important. It bows out. It does what? It bows out. It bows out. Nice job. <coughs> so it bows out the efficient printer. And what happens to the expected return on the portfolio? It goes down. And what happens to the risk of the portfolio? Does it go down a little or does it go down a lot? It goes down more than It goes down more than the reduction in the expected return on the portfolio. So your expected return goes down, but your portfolio standard deviation goes down even more then what happens? What kind of return? Yeah. Risk adjusted rate of return goes up or down. Up. Are you better off as a risk averse an institutional investor or are you worse off? Are you better off or worse off? You're better off. And what if I can get Eight to ten percent rate of return annually on my portfolio. What happens to the value of the portfolio? It goes up. Rule seventy-two. Double time. Doubles. Ten years. Doubles. In ten years. In ten years or less than ten years. Less than ten years. Less than ten years. Okay, less than ten years. Okay, so you know now we have to uh, add in the alternatives to the stock bond portfolio. What would be the target for the model portfolio? 30% bonds. 30% bonds. Okay. 30% stock. 30% stock. 10% alternative energy. 10% alternative energy. Okay. 10% life insurance. 10% cash value life insurance. Direct private equity real estate. Is there research backing up this allocation? Is there research that backs up this allocation? Uh, if it's in an associates, if it's in an associates, Deutsche Bank. Can I bow out the efficient frontier using any other tools? Is there any other tools available in the capital markets that I could use, use to hedge off market risk and provide portfolio insurance for the portfolio? Are there any other tools that I can use? What other instruments can I use to hedge off market risk and provide portfolio insurance for my portfolio. Are there any other instruments? If I'm forecasting the value of my portfolio to go down, can I identify three indexes whose correlation is positive with the return on my portfolio? I identify three exchange traded funds whose returns are correlated my portfolio and I identify five stocks whose returns are correlated to my portfolio, can I apply and utilize financial tools to be able to hedge off the market risk and provide portfolio insurance to my portfolio? Yes. So if I've identified, let's say, three indexes whose returns are correlated to the return on my portfolio, what would I use? What tools could I utilize? Right. I could I could write forward contracts. Okay. <coughs> what else can I do? Write futures. Write futures. What else? Write calls on futures. Excellent. So I could write calls on futures. What else? Buy puts. I could also buy <coughs> puts on futures for how many trades? Any trades. I found three indexes were correlated to my indexes. Okay. I also
also found three ETFs. Whose returns were correlated with my portfolio? Are there any tools that I could utilize to hedge off the market risk and provide portfolio insurance to my portfolio? I could what? Again, remember, I'm trying to hedge off downside risk. I'm trying to hedge off the value of my portfolio going down due to market declines, market risk. So what could I do? What could I do with the ETFs to hedge off the risk? Sell short. Could sell um, short. Right calls. Right calls. I can buy puts. I can buy puts. And let's say I found three ETFs. Yeah, how many trades? Nine. Excellent. And I also have some stocks in my portfolio. Uh, that have an impact on the performance of my portfolio and the returns of my portfolio? Could I hedge off stock market risk using some financial tools to hedge off the market risk, the stock market, and provide portfolio insurance to my portfolio? How would I do that? Buy stocks. I could sell short. I could write calls. Or how many trades? Fifteen. And how many trades could I do? So I could do thirty-six trades that would hedge off market risk and provide portfolio insurance for our portfolio. If I do that, can I lock in the expected return on the portfolio using these contracts? lock in the expected return on the portfolio using these tools? Yes. Can I reduce the portfolio standard deviation in the portfolio by applying these tools? Can I increase the risk adjusted rate of return on the portfolio? Are my clients better off if they're risk averse and institutional? Okay. Nice job. Okay, so let's do the intrinsic valuation. I don't understand very how do you come up with valuations for securities? Can you walk me through? <coughs> now our team can walk me through. Um, so how many intrinsic valuation methodologies do you use? Four. Four. The first one we use is what? Perpetuity. EBIT per share? <clears throat> Can I use EBIT per share? Yes. Can I use EBIT? Can I use NOI? Can I use earnings? Can I use earnings per share? Can I use dividends? Yep. So very versatile. Okay, what about Gordon Grove? We also use Gordon Grove. <coughs> Cash flow equals one. What is it? Cash flow equals one. Okay, excellent. Well, what does the G tell you? What? Constant growth. Constant growth in what? Constant growth in what? The cash flows. Excellent. Yeah. G is the constant growth rate in the cash flows forever. Okay. Now, 
the next one's going to be a little bit more challenging. Oh, Give me the old one. Cash flows. Cash plus flow. one. Two plus one. Times the multiple. Times the multiple. Do I use last year's multiple, this year's multiple, or next year's multiple? Next year's. Next year's. And what does that give me? Uh, using the multiple fraction. Okay. How can I come up with the multiples? Compared <coughs> to the different methodologies. Um, yeah, I can use price of earnings per share. Uh, and give me the calculation. One over i minus g. Uh, one over i minus g. I can do one thing that way. You can also do one over i. Over what? I. You can also do perpetuity. One over i. You can always use perpetuity. Okay, one over i. So when I do, when I calculate the multiple using this, and multiply it by that, is the value the same as the value for the perpetuity. If I use 1 divided by i, am I going to get the same value as the perpetuity model? When I take 1, one divided by i, and multiply it by the cash flow to get the value, yeah. is it going to be the same as the perpetuity? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And if I use 1 divided by i minus g, is it going to be the same as the Gordon Brown? Yes, it is. Excellent. You can use price to earnings. Can I use uh, the value of the firm divided by the EBITDA? Yeah. To get a multiple? Yes. Can I use the value per share divided by the, uh, uh, the multiple, I mean the uh, cash flow per share? Yeah. So I can use, I can do value, I can do, um, I can do price um, to get both different types of multiples. And then usually what the investment bankers will do is they will know what the multiples are, which we'll do in case study one. They'll know what the multiples are, and they'll be able to apply them. But they'll do these two. So walk me through the uh, DCF model. I don't understand the DCF model, Larry. Have your team explain to us, the board of directors, the DCF model. So can we walk you through a, maybe a three-year holding period? get cash flow T plus one? How do we get that? Holding period? Now, how do I calculate um, cash flow next year? Cash flow times your growth rate. What? Cash flow times your growth rate. And then cash flow and T equals zero times growth rate. Is that right? Period cash flow plus one, and then what do we do? Do what? One plus one plus i. One plus i. That. To the one. To the two. To the one. To the one. One. Okay. Plus cash flow is t plus two. Cash flow plus two. And how do we get the second year cash flow? Get the second year's cash flow? Multiply it. By what? Multiply what? How do we get this one from here? You uh, expect a growth? Yeah, you get a growth. One plus G. Okay. Now what do we get? Over one plus I squared. Okay. And remember, it's a three year old. so that everybody can hear. Grow up cash flows one more year. Okay, so we got to grow up the cash flows one more year to what year? One more. Two plus three, so we got to grow it out one more year. Okay, 
and we get cash flow in the third year. Sorry, fourth year. Okay, now what do we do? If I divide by I minus G, what do I assume? What am I assuming? In regards to the cash flow. Constant growth. In constant value. growth. Okay. Uh, what if I want to be conservative? What would I do? If I want to be conservative, what model can I use? Perpetuity. And that assumes what? In regards to the cash flow. Or flat. flat. Right. Okay. And then what does this give us? This is the terminal value. Okay, so then we get the terminal value. And then what do we do with that? Add the terminal value yeah. back to the previous year. So we have the terminal value. Now what do we do? Calculate it. Uh, what do we what do we have to calculate next? Walk us through the steps. What do I calculate next? Yeah, what's this, what are these called? What are these things called? Um, expected return. Discount factors. Okay, so then we calculate the discount factors. And then what do we get? What do we get? These called? What are those called? Can we calculate the discounted cash flows? Then what do you do? Then what do you do? Calculated the discounted cash flows. And you divide. I already did it. I calculated the discount factors. Thank you. And you divide the cash flows by the discount, discount rates to get the discounted cash flows. And, you add them all and then you add them all together to get what? And if the, you take the present value and you subtract what? What? You take the present value and then you subtract? Acquisition cost. Yeah. The acquisition cost. What else? What else could it be? It could be the building cost. It could be uh, the cost of construction. What else could it be? It would be the price of the stock. Right. And what's this? Net present value. What? Net present value. Net present value. And if the net present value is positive? Accepted. And if the net present value is negative? Present value. This is your iteration number one. What do you do next when you really want the project? Renegotiate What is it? Yeah. So you renegotiate and reduce yeah. acquisition cost by how much? In the amount of the negative present value. And if you can do that, what does the net present value turn out to be? Yeah. Zero. And do you accept or reject? Accept. Uh, but if you get a negative net present value, still, you can't get the price reduction. What's the iteration three? Audit your assumptions. Okay. Audit your assumptions. Give me the assumptions. Growth rate. Growth rate and cash flows. Yeah, we know. We've already gone through a lot of them. What? Data? Uh, the uh, lack. Do you know more about the lack? Obviously, we're using beta and the cap M. What else? Terminal value. Uh, terminal value. Risk free. Risk free. Uh, 
Uh, we're using WAP right here. Talking about that. Uh, return on the market. How to count them. What else? Cash flows. Uh, the level of the cash flows. Cash flow level. Not only the growth rates, but the actual level. What others? Did you say the overall data? What? Did you say the overall data? No, let's not go there. Let's just focus on the assumptions that we're on. Tell me more about uh, WAC. We talked about CalPAM. Is there another? Any other assumptions? Uh, uh, no, no, no. That's the IRR is going to be the discount rate. Your weights. Yeah, the weights. Okay, so the weight of the debt, the weight of the equity. Did you use book value or market value? What else? There's a few more. What other assumptions? Revenue. Yeah. No, we already got cash. What other assumptions? They're, they're on the board. You went through. There's premium. Uh, yes, there was premiums that you used when you were calculating your debt. Okay. Uh, give me two more. Yeah, what? Uh, that's on the lock. Uh, we already have that with the data, the mystery rate, the return on the market using capital. Give me two more. We're missing one. Missing two. Terminal value. You want to be assumptions around the terminal value. How do you calculate the terminal value? Made by mistakes. Too low of a G, too high of a beta, too high of a risk free rate, too high of a market, expected market return, too high of a whack, too low of a terminal value, too low of cash flows, too high of risk premiums. Uh, maybe I used uh, too much weight on the equity because equity is higher cost than debt. Maybe I underestimated the terminal growth rate. Overestimated the discount rate, terminal discount rate, which means I underestimated the terminal value. Bad news, I still get a negative NPV. So, what's uh, iteration four? Okay, I got to calculate the value of the real call option. And what is the value of the real call option you got to be to make this project work? What is the value of the real call option you have to be? The value of the MPV. What? The value of the MPV. What kind of MPV? Is it positive or negative? Negative. Okay, so it's got to be negative MPV in the Okay. So if the real call option value is equal to the negative MPV, well, what's the net net present value? Zero. Zero. Do we accept or reject? Accept. And if the value of the real call option is less than the negative MPV, what's your net net present value? Negative. negative. And then are you going to yeah. accept or reject the project? Yeah. That's all you can do. That's all you can do. And we'll go through that again. So let's do the um, let's do the problem. Okay. Can I miss anything? Yep, Okay, I can do it. You guys gonna have to help me. So we're Intel, we're uh, Oracle. Um, we want to buy a tech company. Or the investment banking division and the corporate finance department on the investment bank. And they hired us to uh, do the investment analysis and come back with a recommendation. So we're going to do this. So what do we do? How do we do it? So how do 
we do it? Let's do, go through evaluation. So what evaluation uh, method should we use first? What method should we use first? Yeah, exactly. So let's do that. Okay. And then what do we need to do? What's the first step? What do we need to do? What cash flow do we need to come up with first? Next year's cash flow. Okay. So give me the calculation to calculate next year's cash flow. Well, do you have last year's cash flow? Yeah, what's last year's cash flow? Okay. We gotta get next year's cash flow, so what do we do? And what do we come up with? 140 million. Okay, X. Right. And then what do we do? <coughs> We're going to bring it up with 0.22, which is our expected return, and what's the value? 1,090. Just round up. Okay. Uh, now, what's the next model we can use? Growth. So the same Okay, same tw two hundred forty million. Over point two two minus yeah, point of What does that give us? One thousand four hundred. No, no, what does this give us? Yeah, what's the discount factor? Point one seven. What's two hundred forty million divided by point one seven? One thousand four hundred and twelve million. Okay, I'm not hearing it from anybody. Uh, I need to know, I got to hear it from other people. I mean, I grant, grant I totally trust you. <clears throat> but I need to hear it from other people so I can verify. Okay, is that correct? Yeah, I thought it was 1,421. Uh, is it 12? 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. 12. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we have that. Now let's do multiple. This is going to be harder. Okay. So we use the same cash flow. 240 million times what? Times the multiple equals the value for the multiple approach. So give me some uh, multiples. Calculate the multiples for me. I want to take you through the multiples. I did one over 0.22. Uh, so you did uh, one over 0.22. And can you give me the multiple for that? What is that multiple? Okay, round up. What's 1 divided by 0.22? 4.5. So basically 5 times. Okay. Enjoy it. Uh, at the very top, it says calculate the multiple using a 12% expected return. Okay. Where does it say that? On the models used. Oh, that's, don't worry about that. Okay, just wondered. That's okay. Um, so what other way can I calculate the multiple? What's the multiple that I get there? What is it? 1,412 million. Yep. 1 divided by 0.17. 5.89. So six. six. So six times. So if I multiply the 5 times the 240, do I get the perpetuity? If I multiply 5 times this, do I get the perpetuity model? Yes. Yes. Okay. And if I multiply 6 times this, do I get the random growth? So based on our assumptions, we're using uh, multiples between five and six. Now let's see what the seller is using in regards to a multiple. So how much is the seller wanting to sell this uh, this firm for? Four billion. How much? Four billion. Four billion. And what was last year's cash flows? What is the multiple using last year's cash flow and the current stock price? What's the multiple? What's the multiple? This is what the seller is selling it for. This is what we're trying to buy. So what's the multiple that the seller is, is applying to get the valuation? 
What is it? 20. 20. And then let's use the uh, 240. Okay? So that's 4,000 divided by 230. What, what, what multiple do you get for that? 16.7. So, uh, 17? Yeah. So we got a problem here. We got a problem. The uh, seller is applying a between a 20 times and a 17 times cash flow to get the, their valuation for a billion. We're applying five and six to get ours. We have a huge discrepancy here between the valuations using perpetuity and Gordon growth and the four billion dollars that these guys are coming up with. Now we get to do the uh, discounted cash flow. Check that again. We may have a why would the seller apply um, 20 times cash flow? 20 or 17, what are they assuming? They're gonna grow really quick, right? They're gonna be fast growing firm. So we're totally underestimating what they believe that they can grow the cash flow. Mm -hmm. okay, so we have a total discount. So walk me through the DCF. What do we do? And what are we trying to calculate here? Getting these numbers? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, keep going. Uh, what do I grow this at? 1.75. Okay, and that's 363? Just round up. Six-year cash flow. Do we divide it by? Four Everybody getting this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And then what's this? 2.7. Excellent. Okay. So what's this divided by this? 196.7. Is it? 196.7. It's just around that. Okay. 
Is everybody getting this? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, 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 that's right. This is what? No, no, no. This time, this. Divided by this. What is it? Is that right? So far? <coughs> yes? Yes? No? Yes? No? It's the critical juncture. Is that right? 2,253 divided by 2.7? Yep. I got 80. Are these all correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So what's 834 plus 164 plus 179 plus 190 plus 197? Yeah, present money. What is it? <coughs> What's that net present value? Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay, accept or reject. Give me the assumptions. I already gave them to you, so give them to me again so that we can learn over again. Uh, okay. No, no. What are the assumptions we're going to review? There's Creed. There's Creed. What? Return on the market. There's premiums. Cash flow and levels. Beta and cap M. Growth rate and cash flows. Values, what about the terminal value? What do we audit the terminal value? The growth of this is uh, terminal growth rates. Yeah, interest. What? Uh, interest. It's not called the interest. Interest rate. Yeah, we already got those there. What yeah. about the terminal values? We have the growth rate. in the terminal value. Okay, and the, uh, you can do weight of the debt, and the equity. What else about the terminal value? We only have the growth rate. I need one more variable. Huh? But it's also called what? Uh, what kind of lack is it? If I'm calculating the terminal value, I'm going to use the terminal growth rate, I'm also going to use what? Discount rate. Terminal discovery. Okay. Any other variables? We have risk premiums, we got risk free rate, we got beta, we got return on the market, we got growth rates, we got uh, I and G on the terminal values, we got the weighted capital structure. Anything else? No? We still got negative MPV. 
do we need to do now? Generation four. Calc. Real call option. What does the real call option value need to be? To or greater than the 2,436 million. And if the call option value is equal to the negative MPV, then what is the net, net present value equal to? Zero. Can we accept or reject? If the real call option value is greater than the negative MPV. What's the net, net present value? If the real call option value is greater than the negative net present value, what's the net net present value? If the real call option value is greater than the negative net present value, what's your net net present value? Negative. Is it positive? Are you going to accept or reject? Yeah. And if the real call option value comes in under the negative net present value, what's your net, net present value? Negative. Negative. Do you accept or reject it? Negative. Okay, that's all you need. That's it. We'll do the other two on Thursday. And bring your memos to it.